Quaker, Unitarian, Congregationalist, Russian Orthodox, Islamic, Roman Catholic, Ami Baptist, Greek Orthodox, Hebrew, Episcopalian, Methodist, the Free Church. Why here? Why did the Blackstone Valley attract such a variety of religious faiths? We might guess that it was the many mills that lured immigrant groups who brought with them their own religious faiths, who were responsible for the great diversity in religious belief here in the Blackstone Valley. And you certainly wouldn't be wrong, but there is a deeper meaning to the Blackstone Valleys and America's religious diversity. Hi, I'm National Park Service Ranger Chuck Arning here in the John H. Chafee Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And the story behind the deeper meanings of the Blackstone Valley's religious diversity takes us back to America's very beginning. It was 1631 when Roger Williams and his wife Mary stepped foot into this new land, a wilderness by any definition, particularly if you think about it from the 17th century English mind. And yet, this was a land that was already had successful civilizations, the Nipmunk, the Narragansett, the Wampanoag, just to name a few. Simply transplanting English ways and English beliefs may not be an effective way in this new land. So join me as we take a look at the strong-willed man, Roger Williams. The 17th century new world and all the pressures are in it, and religious diversity, how important it is to us then and to us today. Mr. Williams holds forth these four particulars. First, that we have not our land by patent from the king, but that the natives are the true owners of it, and that we ought to repent of such a receiving of it by patent. Secondly, that it is not lawful to call a wicked person to swear, to pray as being actions of God's worship. Thirdly, that it is not lawful to hear any of the ministers of the parish assemblies in England. Fourthly, that the civil magistrate's power extends only to the bodies and goods and outward states of men. The church's brethren felt he was an incorrigible offender and that the Boston court was patient, lenient, and long-enduring, that he was obstinate, wrong-headed, and persistent in his purpose to disturb the peace and harmony of the colony. They passed the following sentence. Whereas Mr. Roger Williams, one of the elders of the Church of Salem, hath broached and divulged diverse new and dangerous opinions against the authority of the magistrates, as also writ letters of defamation, both of the magistrates and churches here, and that before any conviction, and yet maintaineth the same without any retraction. It is therefore ordered that the said Mr. Williams shall depart out of this jurisdiction within six weeks, now next ensuing which if he neglect to perform, it shall be lawful for the governor and two magistrates to send him to some place out of this jurisdiction, not to return any more without license from the court. For all experience tells us that public peace and love is better than abundance of corn and cattle. I have only one motion and petition, which I earnestly pray the town to lay to heart that after you have got over that black brook of soul bondage yourselves, you tear not down the bridge after you by leaving no small pittance for distressed souls that come after you. What are all the contentions and wars of this world about, generally, but for greater dishes and bowls of porridge?
those little pieces of history hidden away in the Blackstone Valley is rather significant as far as the development of a, as a country, isn't it? It is. This small little park right here is the kind that you can drive by 30, 40 miles an hour and miss it. But this is the site of one of the very first settlements that was based on freedom. Roger Williams Spring here in East Providence. That's right. Rhode Island. And this guy, Roger Williams, he was quite a character, wasn't he? Absolutely. He's the kind of person that would argue with you even if you agreed with him. John Milton says at one point that you can be saying something that's absolutely correct and still be a heretic if you only say it because someone else told you. And what Roger was doing by arguing with people that even agreed with him was to test and see how strong their beliefs were and what their beliefs were based on. Now, Roger came here in a winter. Yes, yes. And you tell me he's a city boy. He was born and brought up in London. He went to university at Cambridge. Okay, They're cities. If Roger wanted a new coat or a meal or something like that, he would go to a market or he would go to a tavern. Okay, Coming out here to the wilderness, being cast out of Salem, north of Boston, in February, he had at least two weeks to get down here to Massasoit, where they could give him some shelter. Okay, where the Native Americans here could give him shelter. That's two weeks in the wilderness of somebody that didn't know how to find his way north, south, east, or west, didn't know how to get food out in the wilderness. This was a terrifying aspect for him, but it's something, and it's something that he could have avoided, too. Roger was given the chance to recant any of his ideas in court, but he refused to. He refused to back down on his own beliefs, and the penalty for that was to be cast out into the wilderness. And you have to remember, to the 17th century mind, the wilderness was full of savages and spirits and all kinds of things that would terrify a person, particularly someone who brought up in a city. So this is the kind of thing, this is as close to being cast into hell as you possibly could. And it was his beliefs that drove him to this point. Absolutely. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of those beliefs that he held so dearly? Well, the foremost belief was that the government, the magistrates or whoever, had no right to tell you when, where or how to go to church. That was something that belonged to yourself, your own individual conscience. He also believed that it was right to buy the land from the Native Americans, that you had to deal with the people that were already here. Okay? You couldn't just take the land because the king over in England had given it to you. Okay? The people that were living here had rights to the land. Those are the two major reasons that he got kicked out of Boston. There were some smaller reasons, one being that he didn't feel it was right for a minister to be paid because that made him a mercenary. And there was always contentions with other ministers and other, other people in the town. But those are the two major regions. The government didn't have any right to tell you when, where, or how to go to church, and that you had to buy the land from the natives. And with that belief about the government not telling you when to go to church was also bred tolerance of other people's beliefs. Oh, absolutely. Roger at one point said, once you've gotten across the bridge of bondage yourself, don't burn it down in back of you. Leave it open. Have a place where everybody can come for their beliefs. Okay. Providence was established, Providence, Rhode Island was established as a place, as a haven for those persecuted of conscience. And that's something that Roger strongly believed, that everybody had the right to follow their own conscience. Shortly after they had, they had established a small settlement here, building houses and starting to plant the fields around here, they got a letter from Plymouth. And Plymouth basically said, Roger, we like you, but we like our relationship with Boston even better. The Seekonk River, the river that's just outside here is the boundary of the Plymouth Colony. You have to go across that somewhere else. You can't stay within the bounds of the Plymouth Colony. So Roger and a few others got into a canoe, sailed across the Seekonk River to a place on Gano Street that's now a small park on Gano Street, a place called Slate Rock, where he ran into a group of Narragansetts. And they greeted him with something that's fairly familiar in Rhode Island, a saying, it's what cheer Neetop, which is a combination of English and the Native American language. What cheer being pretty standard English for what cheery news do you bring, or what's going on, what's up? And Neetop is the Narragansett word for friend. And Roger Williams runs, runs into these Narragansetts on the other side of the river, and they give him this wonderful piece of property that is now the city of Providence. Whereas Boston and Plymouth and Salem and Hartford wanted well-ordered and well-structured societies and civilizations, Rhode Island was looked on as being this anarchistic place where anybody could believe whatever they wanted. And Luckily, out of that diversity of belief came a real strength that the rest of the country, the rest of the colonies, identified with a hundred years later. Very important stuff for us today, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, it's the foundation of America's freedom. It's right here, starting at this little spot, this little bubbling bit of water coming up out of the ground. That's amazing. And if Roger Williams was with us today, and he saw the great diversity with uh, uh, Islam and mm -hmm. uh, 
We still have Quakers active in the valley. Absolutely. Well, what do you think about all this? I think that would please him more than anything else, that finally people were not pe persecuted for their conscience. The religious pressures placed upon the early New Englanders and the original inhabitants, the native peoples here in New England, was indeed intense. To learn just how intense it was, we're going to join our National Park Service Rangers to fill us in. Kevin, I know from my early history lessons that the Pilgrims landed in, in Plymouth and another colony landed north in Boston. And they were called Puritans. But I've often used the term interchangeably, Pilgrims and Puritans. What is the difference? Well, the difference between them is fairly simple. Uh, the Pilgrims, the group that landed down at Plymouth, mm -hmm. uh, were part of a sect known as the Brownists. And they were separatists. They believed that they had to separate completely from the Church of England to form a new church in order to worship God in the way that they saw fit. Now, on the other hand, the Puritans uh, were trying to purify the church. Uh, they were staying within the official Church of England, but they were trying to set up what they called the, the city on the hill. They wanted to have an example of how uh, moral living and living in the way of God uh, could be done and hope that they would set an example that people back in England would begin to follow and therefore they'd be able to bring about a change in the Church of England. So as we were taught as children in school, both groups came here with at least some motivation for religious freedom, freedom away from that church in England. Right, and of course the Church of England uh, is controlled uh, by the Archbishop and also by the King or the Queen of England, who's the King of England back at that time. And one of the complaints that the, that the Puritans had was that uh, although the, the Anglican Church had been formed to separate from the, the Catholic Church under Henry VIII, that they hadn't gone far enough away from some of the, the practices that the Catholic Church had been doing for the past 1,500 years or so by that point. And so they were looking for a way that they could get back to uh, a more simplified uh, sense of worship. Um, and so we, we, we talk a lot about uh, their plain clothing and their, their strict ways. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that, that they believed in was that uh, you, 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 although you couldn't earn your way into heaven by your good deeds on earth, that, that only certain people had been uh, preordained, predetermined to, to go on, uh, that you wanted to, to live uh, a life of, of uh, piety and, uh, and godliness so that you would be prepared, if you're one of the chosen, that you'd be prepared to go on uh, into heaven and to live with God. And if you weren't one to go on, you wouldn't really know anyway. That's right. They, they, so they sort of believe that, that you, would, you would know, that, that you'd get a, a sense or a feeling that you had the inner light. Now, uh, Roger Williams, of course, came to Providence, and uh, he helped found this wonderful church that we're in today, although not this particular building. Uh, this building dates back to 1775, uh, but back in 1638, Roger helped to create the first Baptist church here in America, but he only stayed with them uh, for about three months. Um, Roger Williams uh, went through a number of different uh, theological thoughts while he was living first in Plymouth and Boston and Salem, and also once he came here to Providence. So he spent time with the separatists in Plymouth and the Puritans in Boston, and then came here. That's right. Well, and he even started off as an ordained Anglican minister. So he, he, he covered all the bases, and which is actually makes him a very interesting character because in that point in history, both in England and here in America, you're seeing a huge amount of theological debate on just uh, how people should be worshiping and also, of course, the idea of how the church and the state should be related. Back in England, of course, it's the church and the king and the court are so closely tied. In Boston, on the other hand, it's the magistrates are very closely tied with the Puritan church. When Roger Williams comes here to Providence, he wants to have a, a, a distinct separation between church and state and that uh, while the church would be uh, looking after uh, the, the moral ways and, and trying to set a good example, that the actual uh, laws of the community uh, would be uh, regulated separately from the church itself. It all sounds like a very nice, quiet, intellectual difference here. 
Was it as peaceful and as friendly as all? Oh, absolutely or? not. The, there, there are constant arguments and debates going on. Of course, Roger Williams was banished uh, from Massachusetts for his, his beliefs. And quite late in life, he actually uh, rode, believe it or not, rode a boat all the way from Providence down to Newport so he could debate uh, the Quakers who were beginning to arrive there. Uh, now, of course, practicing the belief of freedom of religion, he allowed or and welcomed the Quakers to come here and live in Rhode Island, but he was quite sure that he was going to tell them the error of their ways. So, Sparkle, here we are in Uxbridge, Massachusetts, in front of the 1770 Quaker Meeting House. It's kind of a fascinating place because uh, the Quakers really believed in the equality between the sexes as far as their beliefs. Uh, they even believed in the equality as far as their opportunity for education. So the Quakers are kind of open about that. But there were a lot of religions were not so open, were they? No, there weren't. Uh, especially the Puritan religion. They had strict rules that you needed to follow. And, and uh, with women, women in the Puritan religion, they weren't allowed to have any, I would say, dominating rules. They were always, they were considered inferior to men, intellectually and morally. So a woman was basically considered a, a, her husband's property. Now, you have a very interesting story about that concept of the female as property um, in a role of religion in, in the community. Why don't you tell us about that story? Um, yes. Well, uh, we call this the Joshua Vernon case. Um, a woman, we believe her name is Jane Vernon, but we were, have some discrepancies on that. But most records found that her name was, was Jane Vernon. Um, when, when Roger Williams founded Providence, he brought along six or seven followers, and they formed this town, Providence. Joshua Vernon, Joshua and Jane Vernon, they lived right next door to Roger Williams. And when the colony started, Roger started holding religious meetings in his home. And Jane Vernon, she opted to go to those meetings. Now Joshua Vernon, he decided he didn't want to go to those meetings. And he felt that his wife was disobeying him because he felt that since he didn't go, she shouldn't go. And he started to beat her as punishment. In May of that year, 1638, the Providence courts held a trial stating that uh, Joshua Vernon, he was, uh, he was disrespecting his wife's beliefs of, of religious tolerance. Uh, he was obstructing her from going to religious meetings. And, and they found him guilty of that and they made him leave the colony. They kicked him out of the colony. We believe that this is the first case of its type in this area where it's uh, defending a woman's right to, to choose, basically. A woman's right to, to, to use her own mind to think freely for herself. the interesting things we've learned about Roger Williams is that he fell as a man of God, as a man of the cloth, that he should not be paid for his preaching. Exactly. How did he make a living? Well, as you were saying, he thought that that would make him a mercenary if he was paid to be a minister. So he resorted to what he knew from a child. His father was a merchant tailor, which means he made his, his living buying cloth and making clothing in London. Roger was brought up in a city, so he didn't know much about farming. He didn't know much about taking care of things in the wild. So when he came over here, he resorted to what he knew. He became a trader. He started making the deal, if you would. And the things that he had available to him were English knives, blankets, hoes, uh, kettles, things like that. And he would trade them with the Native Americans. And this is one of the places where he would have done that. We're at Kokumscusick here, down near, near Wickford, Rhode Island. This is in the heart of what would have been Narragansett territory back then. And Roger established a trading post down here very early on. And this was the place that you came to deal with the Native Americans, with the Narragansett in particular. And the stuff we have here on the hearth would be the types of things that he would trade. Absolutely. The, I mean, the iron kettles and uh, the brass kettles, the things like that that you would find, were items that there was no natural metal around here for the Native Americans to use. So instead of using pottery or ceramics, they would be able to trade for these items. And they didn't just use them for kettles. In some, time, in some situations, they would take the brass kettles and disassemble them to use the metal for other purposes, like arrowheads. By getting kicked out of all the English settlements, he's putting himself out in the wilderness. And he had to depend on what was here already. And the one 
thing that he could depend on was his relationship with the Native Americans. And that was a very powerful relationship, wasn't it? Absolutely. What was the key, John? <sighs> Treating them as human beings. I think that was the basic key. Um, at one point he said his sole purpose was to do the natives good. And he treated them like any other human being. He didn't treat them special. He didn't treat them in any derogatory form. He just treated them as other human beings. He saw them with faults and he saw them with good points. And he took the time to see them, I think. I think that's the key, is he took the time to see them as human beings. That's an important virtue because by doing that, you learn the language and you gain the trust. Exactly. He was the one person that both sides trusted, both the English and the Native Americans, almost throughout his whole lifetime. They trusted him to be an honest interpreter. If there was something that needed to be interpreted, they would have Roger do it. Both of them, both the English up in Boston and the Narragansetts. He was constantly the mediator in between these two very powerful groups in the 17th century here in New England. The Narragansetts and the English up in Boston were very, very powerful, both economically and militarily. And it was also the economic aspect you talked mm -hmm. about is, is a key piece because as you had more people moving in here, mm -hmm. you had the need for more goods. More goods and more land. And that was one of the sticking points um, throughout, throughout their entire relationship. Was there, there was this constant need with more and more English coming across the ocean, this constant need for more land. Now, when Roger came here, you know, we have been talking about his... Uh, uh, religious freedom. Mm -hmm. How did that interact with the natives' way of viewing? Well, Roger at one point said that forced conversion stinks in God's nostrils. Okay. And he would never want to force an Englishman to a certain, political, uh, certain religious point of view, never mind a Native American around here. And he would preach to them if they wanted to listen, but he would also allow them to follow their own religious beliefs. Several times when he was writing in his Key to the Language of America, he says that he would not attend their religious festivities, but he never sought to persecute them for their religious practices either. So I mean, they were included in this whole concept of liberty of conscience. At one point, Roger said, it didn't matter whether you were Catholic, Jew, Turk, or heathen, that you should all be able to follow your own conscience and your beliefs. And that, that's remarkable for just about any country in the world, even today. In 1647, Rhode Island, under the great influence of Roger Williams, passed its code of laws, guaranteeing freedom of conscience. It stated that every man could walk as their conscience persuades him, each man in the way of his God. However, reality has told us that walking in the way of my God is very different than the way you view my God. And there's been a great deal of problems for people who come into this country who worship a different way. Here are some examples to prove my point. When um, Cape Verdeans first came here and tried to establish, as any immigrant group would, tried to establish their, their communities here, what they found is that they had difficulty with some of their very basic needs. So for example, when they wanted a, a place to, to worship there would be problems. Cape Verde has been a Catholic country since the mid-15th um, century. And when they came to the United States, they found that most of, the Cape Verde, most of the Catholic churches were not churches that necessarily would accept people of color. And they went first to Portuguese churches. And, and, and a lot of people have told me that they felt that they were not welcomed by the Portuguese churches because they were people of color. When they, on the other hand, went to African American churches, number one, most of those were Protestant and there was reluctance to go outside of the Catholic religion. And on the second part, a number of the African American church members did not welcome them because they were looked on as foreigners, people who spoke another language. So you will find if you look at the early um, Cape Verdean religious groups, they had to really start their own churches. Well, here in Worcester, of course, as in New England, generally during the colonial period, there was um, an anti-Catholic sentiment, very powerful. You recall that uh, during the colonial period, there was an attempt to take back uh, French Canada, um, and, and Worcesterites uh, participated in that, in that effort. So there was a, 
an anti, what do we call, papist attitude on which the Protestant uh, churches in Worcester were built. This meant then that uh, when the canal was being pushed forward from um, Providence up the, up the river into Worcester, um, somewhat a, a village of 3,000 Protestants suddenly discovered uh, several hundred uh, Irish canal builders to their south, immediate south um, were dismayed by that fact. Here they had m tried to drive them out of, out of Canada unsuccessfully. Now they had them on their doorstep. Um, and consequently, um, there was an early attempt to ban um, Irish Catholics, canal workers from the village. They had to discover strategies for surviving in a place that was essentially hostile to them. Um, one was, of course, among their leaders, like with Father Fenton, the first appointment here in Worcester, to seek out Protestant leadership in the community, Yankee leadership, that might be sympathetic. And so it was in this place, uh, the land for this church was acquired through the help of uh, Stephen Salisbury II, the, the for example. The other tactic was, of course, um, to try to develop communities of their own in neighborhoods in, within, the, within the cities. So here, around this area, in the center of, of what is now Worcester, uh, downtown urban area, um, an Irish neighborhood sprung up with all of the necessary things for living, including a school sponsored by the church itself, grocery stores, um, small saloons, uh, places of recreation. The same is true on the eastern side of the city in what was called Pine Meadow. Self-contained, self-sufficient communities were, were created as ways of, of surviving in a, in a fairly hostile atmosphere. But it is amazing the, the way they were able to uh, um, incorporate their individual efforts together in a kind of joint, united front. Of course, in Worcester, uh, for the Irish, um, it was, in a sense, forced upon them. It wasn't simply that they were Catholic Catholics, faithful, but that the identity was used by the larger community to, to locate them in the social order. So this cooperation among themselves was really, really both a, a necessity and um, a sense of pride and faith. Well, this has been Ranger Chuck Arning of the National Park Service here in the Blackstone River Valley National Heritage Corridor. And one of the enduring lessons that Roger Williams left us was a need and desire for men and women to worship their God in their own way. Unfortunately, it's a lesson we have not learned well. For worldwide, battles rage over religious beliefs. Still, we listen to the words of Roger Williams a great truth can be revealed. He said, a man can discern with his eye, and as it were, touch with his finger, according to the verity of holy scriptures, men's consciences in no sort ought to be urged, violated, or constrained. As a nation, or as a global village, we would do well to heed Roger Williams' words, not to violate, urge, or constrain a man's religious freedom. Until next time, I hope to see you in the valley.